What's happening? It's Yannick Wistala. It's the Yannick Wistala podcast. Fun with yet another four string. Opened up last week's last week's episode with uh, with a Fender P. Good old classic American Fender P from the I don't know, early 2000s. This might be one of the most favorite basses I think I've ever owned. I was going to say that's in the studio right now or no, this is like really on the top, top three or four list, maybe top five list or something like that of bases I've ever owned. It's um, kind of a one off, a one of one right now and uh, unfinished. It's a prototype. It's um, it's Henrik Linder's Matheson four string kind of studio. Uh, how do you call it? A Swiss Army knife base. Um, the full jazz bass pickup setup and uh, p bass setup on one bass on one four string bolt on um really nice actually i don't know what um scale length is feels uh something a little longer than what i'm used to playing so i guess it's not 32 but i'll have to check in with him and uh i wish it wasn't three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning in sweden right now otherwise i'd call him although knowing henrik he's probably awake right now sleeps uh, a little nocturnally the last time i remember <laughs> talking to him about that but yeah i'm having fun practicing on four strings at home right now which is a really nice change of change of pace change of view and i was what was i doing just now uh trying to work on time obviously i'm always working on time and sound um but instead of like playing a playing along to a backing track or playing a big full percussive loop into the looper i was trying to play something with a little bit of space in it um and that did not feel good at all <laughs> right away start off with a mistake good feedback it's always good feedback when you can hit a mistake immediately and you're like okay i know exactly what i need to do to be a little more relaxed a little more centered hit the the note right in the middle really feel the downbeat of where i'm at it's a little better in terms of loop already coming across an issue which is monitoring i didn't play the loop loud enough so in my headphones here the loop is a is not a little it's way lower than the bass so that's unfortunate um i think i changed something between when i was warming up to start a podcast and now and another thing i was doing before i hit record was playing a kind of a sound with the using a pitch shifter in the Helix, I've got the Helix rack here and the, the Helix control on my feet for when I'm doing the podcast. That's kind of my setup for that. And it, I've got the the vibe of like a Mark Letary uh, baritone guitar riff kind of sound. I, he kind of occupies that frequency a lot when I, I, whenever I hear him play baritone and playing that kind of funky pocket stuff. And it, quite often he has an octave pedal or some kind of effect going on. So I was getting that kind of vibe before I started Thank mm-hmm. you. 
It's, oh man, I was thinking the other day about um, being in college, being in music school for the first time in the UK and being around this cat who not that long ago passed away was one of the mainstays of sort of jazz education around the London sort of university college scene. That was Trevor Tompkins. Um, drummer and uh, educator and someone I was sort of around a little bit when I was at the Royal Academy of Music many, many years ago in the uh, mid to late 90s. And he would, people made fun of him about it. I don't know why, because I think it's like one of the most fundamentally important things uh, with rhythm, but his whole thing revolved around like the displacements, like the, the 16th note displacement and being able to play uh, one, one E, one E and, one E and, uh, any, any part of that subdivision on any beat of the bar, you know, in four, in, in multiple time signatures, but fundamentally just four beats in a bar and 16th note displacement and then expand into odd time signatures and base your sort of fundamental rhythmic capabilities off of that really simple concept and, that's exactly what I'm doing here, like 20, uh, <clears throat> a lot of years later, <laughs> shall we say. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing there. I'm just feeling that underlying pulse. And it's amazing how you flash back to moments like that and to people you knew and, and things that really stood out and that you learned a lot from in, in the moment. And it, Trevor's definitely uh, one of those people that stood out in that sense and I, 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 I that was what I was thinking the other day I was I, why were why did people make fun of why were people like oh we're doing the 16th displacements again like he was a broken record and it's actually something I forgot to talk about last week I went off on a couple of different tangents and one thing I really wanted to mention was sort of repeated information there are a couple of people that I listen to quite a bit and um in completely different lanes from music, some in health and fitness and um, just all, all over the place. And one of the, I think one of the common threads between the people who have a great understanding and a great way of communicating what it is they have, you know, their thoughts and their process and their philosophy around a certain subject is they actually repeat themselves quite a bit. And it's not, because they like the sound of their own voice it's because the same few things are fundamentally important to so many strains of their research and so many uh, aspects of their specialist field and I i'm a little bit like that in terms of the time and the sound thing i talk about that really a lot and and put a lot of emphasis on how important time and sound are they're, to me they're the two most important things in all of music um, and of course there are subcategories of them and, you know, articulation and rhythmic displacement, like we're talking a little bit about here. I mean, thousands of, of subcategories of those two main, um, topics. But when, like this week, like when I had very little time to practice, because I was really working on that last video, the pedals versus multi-effects video on the main channel. Um, if you haven't seen that, it's, I'll link it below in the in the description of this video if you're watching on YouTube or in the show notes if you're listening somewhere. Um, because I was working so hard on that, I, I really neglected practicing uh, more than I would like. And I had a, had a gig, had a f really super fun gig in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with Bob Reynolds uh, two nights ago. Uh, thanks for everyone that came out to that. It was a super fun show and a quick, you know, one-off, in and out, bunch of flights bunch of traveling to play like a little 90 minute set but it was super worth it and we i know we all appreciated being back together for the first time since the european tour last fall and sort of looking ahead to playing more dates this year in la and, and maybe being in the studio and recording so it was nice to, to be around the guys again and, and and play good music but i felt pretty deficient in my in my practice before that and uh the, the, the few moments I was able to get to the instrument, I really went back to the basics and thought about exactly those two things. I got to work on time and I've got to work on sound. If it's only for five minutes, that's what I have to work on. And I think I know earlier on in my career, because I think also we get overwhelmed, you know, not least of all today in this day and age um, when, when things are coming at us so fast and there's so much information. I think it's really a, a thousand times easier to lose track of the, the absolute fundamentals of what we do in today's kind of framework. 
with the internet and with smartphones and with all the all the distractions you know as i look over at my phone i'm still in this uh not going to be out of this mode for a while i'm still in the baby monitor uh baby monitoring mode while i'm <laughs> while i'm while i'm taping the podcast um but it's it really is uh easy to get off track and i have to remind myself uh, um Hey, stick with the time and sound. You won't go far wrong. You're, inevitably, you will find an issue with your time and with your sound, and that will, that in itself will give you something to work on where you don't even have to worry about other stuff. You don't have to, oh, what's that one scale or this one chord change or that song, whatever. You don't even have to get that far. You don't, have to, you don't have, even have to think for yourself that far. You can, uh, you can populate your practice routine just by concentrating on the fundamentals and listening for what errors there might be in that in those areas position there ran out of space kind of i think i did this last week as well i wasn't in the in a good sitting position and there, it can be that simple right it can be like oh you realize i'm not sitting right and that's why i get to a certain area of the instrument and suddenly everything everything goes to shit um so yeah and then you find things you're going for and you're not making so okay great let's break that down and it was a rhythmic thing i heard the idea i heard the rhythm still can't do it yeah let's dry it and make it dry oh really dry i would never use this uh this i would never normally use this sound it's a simple pitch meant to be an octave up but I, there's, there's too much of the of the clean sound of the instrument in there for it to be kind of a solo thing. So it actually sounds better down in the lower register of the instrument. Um, so yeah, that's something uh, I and, and I you got back yesterday. I got back yesterday. Pff, I don't know, just I don't know, around six p.m. or something, and did like dinner and baby stuff and bedtime and all that. And then I was like, okay. I've got to get downstairs into the studio and do a little bit of practice. Like I was coming home from the gig. Like it's all over. Like I don't have another gig for a little while now, but my first port of call was to get back with the instrument. And, you know, while everything was so fresh from the gig the night before, that was the time to really, you know, dig in. And I, I recorded it. I, I always, you know, I always had the video there. So I have the video um, for the archive that's sitting on a hard drive now. But I also remembered to hit the voice recorder on my phone and leave it on a music stand next to me. So I actually had the whole gig um, in my phone to listen to bits of that I knew there were issues, um, you know, on the way home. I had three flights coming home. So I had plenty of time to dig in and, and assess what had happened and find the good parts. There were some really great moments with the band and find the weak parts as well and really get back to it as soon as possible. So that was what I was doing last night. Uh, I elected to grab a four string out of the rack and uh, that's why it's sitting here right now. That's why it's featuring in the podcast. And it's re it really is one of my favorite basses. It's kind of, like I said, the, the, the Swiss Army knife of four strings with the, that's the back pickup of the jazz. This is the P. Uh, I like that. 
that's just the P, and then where's the front pickup of the jazz? Definitely not sitting in the right position to play slap. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is it? What's that market? I used to love that. Um, I, I mean, I still do. I used to listen to it way more. So yeah, and it's active and passive. I mean, it really is the Swiss Army Knife of Basses. It's uh, active and passive. It, it plays really well. I think it's one of the nicest necks I've ever played on a four string like this. Just a super nice utility bass. And at the same time, it's completely unfinished. It's got weird quirks to it. You know, the, the electronics aren't quite wired up the right way. So you sort of have to know it to make it work. And scratch play is sort of peeling away because it was done in a hurry it's cnc so it's you know machine made it was definitely meant to be a cheaper production model i'm not sure if they ended up doing that i'm so out of the loop with the madison thing since a long time now um and it has uh lundgren pickups in it i think i have some lundgren pickups in my triple p madison and uh, not sure what the hardware is. It's even you can see it's even missing the badge on the headstock. I have no idea where that went, or even if it even had one. Um, you know, it's a four bolt bolt on, pretty standard kind of thing. But such a nice instrument. I'm really, it's a little gem that sits uh, sits in the rack, and it, and it does it actually gets played um, more than makes it onto such platforms as YouTube. Um, so I thought I'd bring it out. And, and show people I haven't really played it that much online or IRL, as the kids say, I guess. Um, so yeah, so I I definitely want to uh, I definitely want to reiterate the importance of the repetitive nature of the message. Um, I hear that so like so so much, um, and it just you know I, I'm sure there are beginning people. Oh man, that guy all he ever talks about is. You know, and it would be so interesting to find out if those people paid any attention to it or actually tried even just to do a, a few a few exercises, a few things within the framework of just thinking about time and sound and not getting so hung up on on notes and uh, and sort of theory and all that stuff. Um, I, by the way, I got to address this that's happening behind me. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, yeah, this is all new and in progress. Um, building lights into my built-in pedal shelves here it's all a mess because i that i just started today went to the home depot got a bunch of strip lighting to put in there but it, i think it will look cool in in some videos and it will really help sort of up the production level when i have to showcase pedals and stuff in in shots so i'm looking forward to that being a thing and uh getting it all cleaned up and getting all this wiring out of the way and um also going to be working with a with a real filmmaker somebody who really knows what they're doing uh this coming week we were meant to do it last week but this coming week we're going to get together and uh he's going to really dial in all of the gear i have here so i'm not so i'm maximizing it you know i'd love to get new cameras and all kinds of stuff but i know there's still some life left in the gear i have and while I'm trying to build the channels, you know, especially the main channel, we're trying to hit that 100,000 subscriber goal by um, April. I'm definitely trying to up the production as a bunch of you have already commented and said you dug that and it's an upgrade in production. I'm doing a lot more involved sort of filmmaking things, which has been super fun. It's been amazingly time consuming, unfortunately, but it has been really fun. And, uh, and people are digging it for the most part. Like I commented last week about the, the crappy comment crew um they're still there it's you know you put something out like pedals versus multi-effects uh, which was the last big video on the main channel and you, i already knew it was almost designed that way right you you kind of know that that's going to cause some friction in certain places it was really interesting that not a lot of people commented about the axe effects fm3 
I threw that out there with the GT Core and the HX Stomp and the FM3 as sort of the big three in, in within a few hundred bucks price range. Really important within the same size, the same footprint on the pedal board. Um, not too many people brought that up. I don't think it's as obviously not as popular as the Stomp or the uh, the GT1000 Core, the, the Roland, the Boss thing. Um, there were a bunch of people that were really on one side and really on the other when it came to Boss and, and uh, Line 6. Okay, great, awesome. You know, everyone's going to have their thing, right? Um, and a lot of people... But but yeah, the surprising thing was the amount of people who went like, hey, what about the Zoom blah, 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 and the Zoom this and the Boss, uh, the, the, the Zoom bass, this, that, and the other. I was like, wow. Um, I, I, I really... I did contemplate putting something about Zoom multi-effects in there, but... I yeah, I just I just don't think they. That I'm going to be brutally honest. I don't think they stack up against the Stomp and the GT1000 Core or the FM3. I really don't. Um, and they're not alone in that. It's not like Zoom are, are the only people that don't stack up to it. There are a bunch of people out there making multi effects uh, units, and they just I don't for the for the punch and the money and the quality and the build and all that. I don't think they stack up as well. Um, and sort of utility-wise as well, I think the Stomp is a big winner in that sense. Um, also, also, I don't actually know that much about the Zoom stuff. I only know what I've heard from an audio quality standpoint and what I've seen from uh, like a, an architecture standpoint in terms of how they lay their thing out. I'm not, not a big fan of it. I, again, I don't think it stacks up to the other stuff. Um, and I think there's a reason why more people are using that on, on, on more amateurs are using that, maybe more people on a, on a, on a much tighter budget. Um, and I don't ever see the Zoom stuff being used by professional musicians or, or kind of serious musicians. So I, I'm sure there are exceptions. Um, I'm sure they do some stuff that does sound great. I, like I said, I don't know enough about it, but from what I've heard, it doesn't quite stack up. So it was amazing to see the amount of comments, I think because... Um, there are so many people that do use it because budget is an issue. And that's why I tried to make such an example of, you know, that actually they sat right on this shelf right here. This is the shelf I used to film it, like those, those crazy pedal combinations starting off what was kind of quote unquote cheap and was still over $1,000 for seven pedals. And you sort of only got a compressor, an octave, a fuzz, uh, a modulation. I put a chorus pedal in there, I think, or something and, and a delay. I mean, crazy. Like not a lot of bang for for that much buck, even though they were nice pedals. And then I put the boutique pedals, and that was like three grand. And then the vintage stuff was even more out of control, like, like almost four grand. So when you look at it in those terms, the functionality of the multi effects is is kind of crazy good value for the money. So yeah, I'm all I'm all about trying to. Like I recommend people to sometimes to wait if like is if it's the difference of like two hundred dollars like just wait like even if you have to wait like four months and save an extra fifty bucks a month to get that more expensive unit the payoff is is so much more robust and so much more beneficial to your to your setup I think um, yeah so very interesting to see those comments coming in and also uh, sort of fascinating to understand how the algorithm and people in general, like what people respond to the most. And that was of course controversy, which about the, you know, the $15,000 signature base and the, the, the bullshit between me and Matt Garrison 10 years ago, 11 years ago, whenever the fuck it was um, like people just, they really are into that. They're into the drama maybe more so than the information because it was kind of crazy that so many people missed the point and just sort of attached to the drama so there was like good information i think a fairly decent storyline through that video but most people just heard what they wanted to hear so it's it's an amazing uh, uh case study in like into human behavior through the use of the internet and specifically through the use of YouTube. And not that I'm, the, 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 the other crazy thing is like I could really use that information and just write totally bullshit titles and complete clickbait and, and be as controversial as humanly possible. And, you know, ask chat GPT or such GT, what, how to, I don't even know what it is to write my scripts for me and just say, be, you know, take uh, Stanley Clark and uh, Marcus Miller and write the most controversial script about their bass playing and then make a, make a film like that. I mean, I could do that. That would serve the algorithm. And I think 
based on uh, the limited information I have, it would serve people's uh, needs a lot more. But I'm not doing that, which is which is quite fun to have all that information and know what would be 10 times more successful and choose not to use it. Um, but learning better uh, filmmaking techniques, that's fun. And hopefully building the quality. No, and that's the other thing. It's like not just building the quality of the, of the films and what I choose to put out on YouTube, but actually building the quality of the audience. The, the over riding uh, factor in this is you guys and girls are the best like the people who actually like like the majority like, like we're talking really like 97.23 percent of people are awesome and good so the people i end up interacting with in the comments are fantastic in that sense so i think by cutting out the the nonsense and the bullshit and the clickbait and not serving the way people um seem to instinctively respond to controversy and drama and not sort of making my entire output about that I actually get to hear from a lot of really interesting people and I've had some uh, suggestions made and people chiming in about this that and the other thing and signal chains and uh, effects and all kinds of things that I learned about that I wasn't aware of before and someone I was reading a comment because uh, now I I went from reading no comments and ignoring the internet basically to now reading uh, you know committing to reading every single comment on the on every video I put out for at least the first 48 hours and answering every question so if there's a question I'll answer it if you leave a comment I'm going to read it I'm going to hit the little heart thing so you know I've read it when I do I don't just go there dig 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 I actually go read it I click the heart thing you know unless it's like abusive shitty thing and I'm like well what did you expect <laughs> i'm not gonna respond to that um but yeah uh how, what uh, where did i i totally went off track there um god i hate it when i do that i start to explain something and then i get off track with what i was saying if only i could hit the rewind now see i'm going to go back in the uh, in the edit well the, not there is much of an edit but i'll be listening back to this at some point and uh and be like oh yeah that's where i should have gone with that i was talking about comments i was talking about getting to talk to a lot of people and yes there it is <laughs> i knew i was coming back to it somebody commented that the reason the flea base i had i think last episode when i was talking about signature bases and i'd made an example of flea making that cheap base i thought it was made by ernie ball uh, music man but it wasn't it was actually his own company somebody said i i gotta check that out i haven't fact checked that but according to a commenter on the video last week um that was flea's own production like own company and um apparently he shut it down because he wasn't he was like he didn't really dig the business side of things the the business side of a signature instrument and uh i don't blame him um and yeah and i what did i see him i saw something with him maybe just because i i don't know why it was uh some some in the studio or something they were playing klinghoff was still in the band so it must have been a little while ago and he was playing a bunch of different basses. Um, and I, I did a little research after that episode last week. I realized he had a Fender signature at some point. And um, I, it was amazing, actually, to go do some research and see who had had uh, signature instruments with which company. That was quite an eye-opener. Of course, I didn't write it down. And I'm not going to go and bullshit you guys by trying to remember and getting it half wrong so but but it was interesting to see who had had what where and when and how much they were and how many companies one person had been with and done like a limited run and that was it like they'd literally gone to a company done 500 bases and left within like less than a year and had done that several times uh in in the space of of 10 years i was like whoa just when I was just when I was starting to let the comments get to me and people were just hammering me about, oh, he only did it for financial reasons. I still laugh about that. Like so clueless. I don't know. I, I don't I, I won't hang on this for long, but I, it was amazing that I just don't know where people decide that they where they decide fact um, in, in their in their orbit and how they do their research and, and where they like look at a company like Federa and they look at a company like Madison and say oh yeah he's going from Federa to Madison to make more money you know what I mean he's going from a from a from a company who's been around like a 
35 years or something now. Actually, I don't know how long Matheson's been around, but I don't think it's that long. And Federa is like a kind of a huge company. And they haven't always been, granted, but they are not small anymore. Like, they have a lot of shit going on. They expanded their operations. Their place is huge. They got a bunch of people working for them. And good for them, you know, great to scale up. I think it was a really wise move. And, you know, when I was still in their orbit, I saw a bunch of new stuff happening and bigger premises and more employees. And and then the other side thought, awesome, you know. And Matheson is one person. <laughs> in a workshop in the middle of Sweden. I mean, it's just unbelievable how people can go like, oh, he's doing it for the money. So that was that was quite hilarious. And then I don't think people quite understood that when I bought an F-Base, uh, like, I was actually paying for it. Um, I wasn't getting any money for it. So I actually went so the opposite trajectory from what people perceived. It was quite funny. Uh, and then there were all the things like, well, why did you go from one fifteen thousand dollar base and then you bought an F base and that must have been fifteen thousand dollars? It's like, wow. Just like I would be really, and I have been actually in the past really upset when I put out a piece of information and it's completely wrong, and I have to like, you know, quickly like publicly say, hey, you know what? Last episode that was total horseshit and i was wrong and i hadn't done my research the right way or i remembered something wrong or i misspoke and i'm mortified you know that that the information is 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 somehow inaccurate and people just are very okay with saying no no this is exactly how it is in this comment on this youtube video this is exactly how it is it's been a fascinating case study in the human uh, human condition i guess <laughs> it's not in great condition by the sounds of things but it's funny it's it's been a really a source of uh, of amusement actually i think probably those people don't listen to the podcast it's a much smaller audience but i i would like to imagine that me being amused by it would, would actually annoy them um but also i don't I, zero fucks are given so who, who really cares so let's get off of youtube comments that's enough uh, of this episode and last episode talking about it i'm gonna do some unboxing um i'm gonna have a little sip here and do some unboxing or unbagging rather let's see they've come in two amazon packages and this this is all from uh baton rouge i wish i could remember the cat's name damn i just met him sweet enough to hang around after the gig and say hi i signed a pedal he had a octave pedal with him and uh he had a, a pedal switch topper on it um woo! and i was like whoa it was like a smaller profile and uh it was kind of light i was like oh damn are those barefoot buttons because i use barefoot or have done those are the only ones i've ever used uh just because um oh no missing here <laughs> i have okay here's the first bad re- <laughs> i might have ordered wrong shit well let's see so i said to him i was like oh are those barefoot he said no i got mine on amazon for like 10 bucks I was like no way so as he was standing there i punched it into my phone and bought up the company uh and who are they actually solutech i bought these by the way they're not a sponsor of the podcast they are, I'm guessing, made in yeah, made in China, and um, they were just smaller profile. I'll hold them up to the camera here, see if it will refocus, and give you a look at these bad boys. I got some black, silver, and red ones, um, kind of a matte matte finish, and I got some clear ones. I got twenty clear ones, but they haven't come with an Allen wrench or the screws. Unless, oh, unless they're just, oh, these ones might be pressure. Let's try them out. They just might be clip-on. Oh, I've never seen those before. Uh, Hey, and it's me. So I have a thousand pedals around me. I can actually just see, are they big enough for the stomp? Oh, look at that. They just popped on. Oh, there's me thinking, uh uh-oh, I ordered the wrong thing. And they literally just pop on. So i got to road test these to see if they last or if they just get destroyed. Ooh. But they did just 
like literally pop on. I'm putting three on here so I can hold it up to the camera and show you. So the clear ones pop on and the the, uh, the metal ones in the matte finish, silver, black, and red, have the three screws, as you may be aware if you've used pedal toppers before. So boom, look at that. This They're lower profile. What I wanted, what I liked about them was that they were a little smaller than the barefoot ones I had. Not that barefoot don't make smaller ones, but we're going to find out like barefoot ones are not that cheap. And if you want to deck out a shitload of pedals in them, like a whole pedal board, it starts to run you like a couple of hundred bucks. If you, you know, want clear or you want some nice features on them or something. Um, so I was like, okay, these are, I think, what were these? These were 12 of them for 20 bucks and 20 of the clear ones for maybe 14. So they were not expensive at all. And, Literally, dude told me about them on Thursday. It's Saturday, and they arrived today, so you can't really beat that. And I have an HX Stomp now decked out with three clear pedal toppers that were easy to install, kind of instant. So the clear ones were not Solutech. They were another company, uh, J-Y-O-Y. <laughs> That's amazing. J-A-Y-O-U-Y, guitar effects, something or the other. Their packaging is pretty terrible. I'm guessing they're also not going to last that long. I mean, I think you get 20 for 14 bucks. You sort of know that the lifespan is not going to be eternal. Um, yeah. But I got to say, they feel pretty good. Let's put it on the floor. Feel it under the feet. Yeah. Nice and responsive. They feel good. Okay, I'll take that as a win. And then I'll check out the metal ones. You'll probably start to see them in uh, in videos coming up on YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the unboxing thing. That was a nice little find. And th there were some like not so positive reviews about them, but I, I was lucky that I got to like feel this dude's pedal and like, like tap it and be like, ah, oh, you know what? They're not that bad. That's immediately I thought it was like a European made you know, expensive pedal topper like the barefoot stuff, and it wasn't. So I was like, build quality is good. Let me try them out. For 20 bucks, it's hard to go wrong for uh, for 12 of them. So yeah, let's see with those. Um, now let's get to what I was talking about last week and some research that I have been doing and a meeting I had to... Actually, while I was in Louisiana, I got on this phone call with a super high-end promoter now last week you uh may remember that i was talking about thinking what the one million subscriber goal might be on the main channel um if you're not hip to any of this let me take a couple of seconds and say this is the podcast channel if you're not watching and you're only listening please go over to youtube and check the podcast out on youtube and subscribe to the channel this is brand new it's only been up a few weeks but it's a dedicated channel on youtube for the anagwas dollar podcast the goal is to get to a thousand subscribers quickly as well as 4,000 watch hours to get the channel monetized and move into that world. Um, like I said before, that is not about trying to uh, use YouTube as an income, but it is about trying to upgrade all of the things I'm able to do for the podcast. So if that can like sort of sustain itself and help, you know, uh, I'm, I'm working on doing some multi-person interview stuff. So I'm going to need a couple more microphones, a couple more boom stands, maybe an extra light. Those things, if the if the channel can help generate that rather than it being a, a all an out, out, upfront, out-of-pocket expense, that would be amazing. And the big goal is on the main channel, on my Yannick Wizdala YouTube channel, is to hit 100,000 subscribers by April. So we've got... Three months left to do it by the end. Less than three months to do it by the end of April. And uh, we're kind of cranking. It's up to 71,500 so far. And it's been it's been going great. But it needs to. we need to kick it into gear even more. So I'm working hard on it by making films, obviously. And just dragging people along and, and saying, hey, we're actually doing something uh, kind of cool and, and potentially useful if you you know, orbit the world of music and especially bass and pedals and effects and all that kind of stuff. So that's been going great. Um, and the goal, the ultimate goal is to go a million and far beyond because that opens so many other doors for what I really want to do with, you know, with the rest of my life, actually. It's kind of, it's a big deal. It's it, That was one of the things people were, and maybe what I'll close this podcast with is uh, how 
how much people get on you for making money. That was very strange. And I have a few thoughts about that. And there was good feedback. A few people left some really nice comments and had very eloquent ways of uh, of putting it. Um, and I've been digesting those thoughts and adding some thoughts of my own and doing some reading and stuff. And very interesting. Um, so maybe we'll get to that in a minute. But the big goal is to get way beyond a million subscribers, much like people in the, in similar lanes like the Adam Neelys and the Rick Beatos of the world. And, you know, because what I want to do is play live music. Um, as much as I love being here and making films and, and doing that side of things, what I've always wanted to do since I first picked up an instrument and what I've always done and what I will always continue to do until the end of my life is to play live, is to record albums and play live music. And what happens when you build the, the audience that big on a platform like YouTube is a lot more doors open. And it, it doesn't just mean that, okay, promoters are going to take me more seriously because I've got this big fat number sitting next to my name on YouTube. It's also that, you know, look at Rick Beato, for instance. Um, not that he doesn't, uh, not that he's not deserving of this anyway, but just look at the size of his channel. And it's, uh, somebody told me, it's, I haven't really seen much of it lately, but somebody told me it's up over three uh, and a half million subscribers or something. So think about, and, and basically what, what I want to highlight is the fact that he has people like Sting and Pat Metheny and apparently Keith Jarrett or is, is I, I, apparently he posted a photograph with him and Keith Jarrett. So there might be a Keith Jarrett uh, interview coming out. Like I was talking to Ruslan about this uh, when we were in Baton Rouge and, and he made a great point. He's like, well, where else does Sting go to get three and a half million eyeballs on his latest thing? It's not television anymore. Um, it's not a random post on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. But if you go and do an interview on Rick Beato's channel, you're going to get millions and millions of people in a day to 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 see you and and to and to to take notice of what you're doing and to be able to talk to a much wider audience. So, for me growing the channel and, and having access to that many people makes it far more possible for someone, you know, like Sting, for instance, well, that would be a fantastic bass player to bass player interview. It'd be, I have a thousand questions I'd love to ask him about his life and how it relates to the bass and his writing and all that stuff. And if I had 2 million viewers, he would absolutely consider doing it. I think a lot more people would, um, you know, people that I don't know. I mean, obviously I know a bunch of people who are, big already and I could call them and I have and you Victor's been on and Patatucci and a whole bunch of people but it really opens some doors to having way more interesting conversations with way more people um, and just making that being able to share things with a wider audience and being able to share more special things with a wider audience so as much as we'll talk about money in a minute it's really not about that at all it's about the channels being able to um, power themselves you know it's like give them the, the the channels to give themselves a budget to really produce those films for for the audience, for it not just to be a complete loss leader, for instance, for for it not to just be some sort of vanity project where I spend tens of thousands of dollars renting studios and uh, and doing crazy things for no return. You know what I mean? Um, be awesome if it just broke even, for instance. That would be fantastic. Just to really broaden the audience and I'll go make money playing live shows or something. Or I'll do it somewhere. You know, it'll be a, bring a bigger audience to the books, for instance, you know, that the YouTube channel doesn't have to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Um, that's not the goal of the subscriber count. The, the goal of the subscriber count is to do actually way more stuff for you guys and girls around the world and, and to make it possible for me to come there and present my stuff in person. That is, uh, kind of always has been the goal, although YouTube hasn't been the focus of that. It used to be MySpace, actually, which was, I've talked about that a little bit before, was actually really fun um, before that world sort of died. Uh, it's, yeah, it's always been the focus to travel the world and uh, and play live music. And it's never been the focus to make money. I think, actually, this is a good segue. Let's take a little sip. replenish the voice for a second and 
it's kind of crazy. And I'm not sure exactly what it is. Maybe it's the culture of the internet and social media where so many people are selling a lifestyle, right? And that lifestyle is lavish. It's the house in Malibu. It's the Lamborghini. It's the summers in Saint-Tropez and Monaco. And it's the winters uh, skiing in Aspen. And it's the, the fancy apartment in New York. It's all of those things, right? Um, on those sort of very surface level sort of influencer i think that's the word right you're a social media influencer but then there's a lot of that i'm not saying it's like that's all there is but there is a lot of that and that's a lot of that gets a lot of the attention from what i've seen that's what i hated so much about social media and about you know everything that surrounded it and i think people are really selling that lifestyle and maybe the audience has sort of been a little bit jaded by that. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure how much of the music audience crosses over and watches that tripe, <laughs> you know, and and uh, do they then get jaded by that? So anything they see that that meant that that could possibly have to do with money within the music world, they they react even more aversely to. It. They're like, oh my god, this person is just trying to be like all of those people over there. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about it as 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 the weeks roll on here, and as I get more involved in a, in a conversation with a lot more people, um, an audience uh, this big, I have not had before, for instance, and I certainly haven't got involved in talking to all of them, like literally everyone who takes the time to stop by, and I'll do it on this video as well, on this podcast. If you're on YouTube and you go leave me a comment and and ask a question, I'm gonna answer it. Um, so. I have never been involved in this big, uh, this big a sample size of audience before in terms of having the conversation every day. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, be good to kind of take a poll. Are you jaded by uh, social media to the point where you hold musicians to some sort of unrealistic standard? to where to where art, artists should just suffer their whole careers right because it's crazy and, and and i've had people you know on both sides of the fence they the people who are saying oh you're just doing it for the money okay great and then you've got the people who understand they're like well you just ignore them and we don't mind and the whole crowdfunding the wall thing was hilarious because it was like you had like so the opposite extremes like people were like dude if you crowdfunded a wall i totally donate to that and i was like okay that's okay that's kind of crazy to me i would never never crowdfund a bass or an instrument um in fact i'd never crowdfund anything let's just throw that out there if any of you followed my last album even though i did a pre-sale and that bought in money which ended up paying for the album i was always going to make the album so that's always been my thing like i'm always going to make this podcast um, as long as I can, you know, as long as time allows and time permits, regardless of whether we get like 50,000 followers on the subscribers on this channel or 5,000 or 500,000, whether it even gets monetized or not, you know, I'm still going to keep making it. So the, the, the monetization, the growth of the channel is, um, is, is a side effect. You know, it's a, it's a, as a byproduct of, of having a love for doing, doing the work. And I'm really lucky that I've always had that. I've always loved to do the work. And um, yeah, I'll always keep doing it. It's just to the point now where I have to be realistic about what um, what makes me happiest, uh, what I can justify spending time doing now that I have a family and I can't just, you know, jaunt off around the world any second at the last minute. I have to really plan and it has to be worthwhile. And of course I have to make a living as well and take care of my family. So all of these things sort of come into focus and I'm having to recalibrate and rebalance it all. Um, but the underlying, the fund, the, the, the foundation, my philosophy with all of it is I'm going to do it no matter what. So I'll never crowdfund anything. So all of that to say, it was very flattering for people to say, man, if you, if you did that, I'd totally be into it. Somebody said, I'll just buy you the base or something. If you reach a million subscribers, there were some crazy comments. Um, all of which I would have to politely, uh, decline as nice and as kind as they were. Um, and then, of course, on the other end, there were the people that were like, oh, you, you are just trying to crowdfund the base and you're just doing it for the money. And the accusation of 
I'm just asking, asking, asking. And the irony being that it's actually free to hit subscribe. You know, like you, you can subscribe to the channel and I'm going to give you all of this free uh, information um, on a pretty regular basis at what I hope is already quite a high level and what I intend to make a much higher level than it already is as I develop as a storyteller and as a, as a filmmaker. Um, so actually, like, I'm not getting anything from the subscriber, for instance. So there's no there's no transaction taking place there. Uh, do I make a little bit of scratch from AdSense? Sure, yeah. Actually, with the last four weeks, I made more in, in a month than I ever have done on YouTube. Um, I, I don't mind sharing that. And I, I already said a few weeks ago, once I have a bigger sample size, once I've been doing this regularly, and I, I, I want to show you guys exactly what happened behind the scenes. I'll, I'll show you every single penny that I made. I'll also show you every single penny that I spent, which means then I'm going to show you every single penny that I lost at the end of the day. So it's quite it's quite crazy that people don't um people don't see that or th even think about it you know it doesn't even cross their mind and i or again i don't know but i wonder if people in general have the casey neistats and the marcus brownleys and the the mr beast and, and those kind of huge uh, you know or colin and samir whoever it is like whichever level of youtuber you're talking about maybe they have those people in focus and those people make really millions and millions of dollars from AdSense revenue, maybe they think that's my goal. And the crazy thing is like none of those people I just mentioned ever had that as a goal. Like none of them ever had that, maybe with the exception of Mr. Beast, but he was doing it in such a philanthropic way that he was like, yeah, sure, I wanna make as much AdSense money as possible and do as many brand deals as possible because I'm just going to go give this away. He tells the story of his first ever brand deal. Someone offered him, I think it was for a video game, maybe even a mobile game. You have to go check out. He's mentioned it in a lot of interviews, um, but his first brand deal, somebody offered him $5,000. And he said, if you double it, I will walk outside and give it away to a homeless person like right now. And the, the negotiations went on for like a few hours apparently. And he said he was sort of pacing around his house and phone calls going back and forth. And he's like, just trust me, double it. Like $10,000 looks better than $5,000 in a title. And he's not wrong. He's done the research. He'd spent years doing this. And he said, trust me, it will go viral. You'll get so much bang for your buck on this video. And he wasn't wrong, you know, and he, he really did. He went out and gave away the $10,000 immediately. And uh, the video was huge. And so maybe he is the exception. And even people like Colin and Samir, who interview a lot of, um, uh, I hate the word content creator. And unfortunately, like some of the people they, some of the people they interview really are content creators. And they do talk about the creator economy a lot. So they really talk about the numbers behind YouTube and they get people to show them their back end. Um, and they are definitely into the financial side of things when it comes to YouTube and, and making films and creating content, quote unquote. Um, but the the common thread is that AdSense is actually the lowest um, form of income for any of those people that are in that space. And and again, like I said, for almost no one was it the focus to get into it in the first place. And I think, unfortunately, with a lot of younger people, like I hear more and more and more that like every kid in high school just wants to be a YouTuber. Like that's their goal. They don't want to be a doctor. They don't want to be a dentist. They don't want to be a train driver, an electrician, a musician. No, they want to be a YouTuber. And I get the feeling that a lot of those, if you ask them, it was going to be, yeah, because you can make money doing that rather than I love uh, needlework and I want to share this with the world and oh shit, there are like 10 million people who like needlework and now I make a really good living from that eventually. You know, when when you look at all the people I talked about, they all like did the such a hard grind. You know, the Casey Neistat's, the Pina McKinnon's, even though Casey Neistat came from like a traditional filmmaking thing and had sold um, his TV show, the Neistat Brothers to HBO for I think a million dollars, um, that is, it almost doesn't have anything to do with YouTube. And if you listen to, there's a good one, Rich Roll, I think the interview with Casey Neistat is really interesting. If you listen to like historically what he went through 
which is what actually what I'm, I want to talk about now with myself as well. Um, the million dollar thing is it's just a headline and everyone latches onto it and it's really easy to say, oh, well, Casey Neistat had a million dollars before he even set foot on YouTube. Actually, no. Like, you know, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but first of all, I know there were at least two people involved because it was the Neistat brothers. So that means maybe there was 500 grand each and then you pay taxes on that and then maybe you haven't made any money for the past five years and after taxes on 500 grand like what do you have left 310 maybe 320 depends where you live and then you split that up over the six years that you didn't make money and suddenly you're like a 50 grand a year which is still not bad but Casey had a kid and and then, then, and then, and that's just a little peripheral surface amount of information I know from watching a few interviews. Never mind the reality behind it, which I'm sure is 50 times what he's willing to share in public. Um, although that that is, he's a good example of somebody who's very honest and open about his past and what he went through, and I think it's a great story to share. Um, and I think that's the important thing. That's what I maybe want to finish up with here a little bit is talking about that when people have that. That, that issue with you or people have a problem with musicians or artists making money and there's that sort of cliche that art must come through struggle, um, which I, I think there's some truth to actually. I think, of course, uh, art mirrors life and if you've had a really bland and boring life, maybe your art is going to reflect that. So perhaps struggle is one strand of that thread of, of, your, of your life story, but it doesn't have to be all the strands and it doesn't have to be all the time it doesn't have to be lifelong you know yes there are of course historically uh many artists who who you know you you hear about their their paintings selling at christie's for in the hundreds of millions of dollars now and you you understand when you read history that some of them were, were completely destitute when they were alive and Yes, there are stories like that, but that doesn't have to be a reality now. And I think we, um, I think we, uh, we could perhaps like treat ourselves a little better as artists and, um, and musicians and not feel so ashamed if we, if we see some financial success at some point. I think that's really important. Um, because the audience is pretty quick to shame, it seems. Um, not all of them, of course. That's, that's, that's not some blanket stereotype statement of all audiences everywhere. But there's definitely a faction of the audience which doesn't get it, you know. And I, I would really bet a lot of money on the, that faction of the audience having actually nothing to do with any sort of artistic process themselves as well. They're just sort of, you know keyboard critics and uh their little thumbs are working overtime on the on the comments and yeah it's it's uh i don't think i think it's something that's not really talked about enough amongst musicians um and it's you know i i don't see like uh let's pick who, who are we gonna pick i gotta pick someone like totally at random and who's that gonna be uh, should I pick a bass player? No, let's pick like someone I don't know, and we'll probably never run into it. No, um, I don't. Know. Let's, let's Steve Vai, for instance. You don't you don't hear Steve Vai breaking down his um, streaming revenue for the year or to the gross of the tour that he does or something like that. In the same way, you see YouTubers literally sharing screenshots of their of the back end of their channel showing exactly how much they made every single day for a year um you know there there's there so much more information sharing it seems on the youtube platform where there are people a lot of them are charlatans and they're, they're trying to uh, even if they have been successful they're still trying to sell you on some bullshit course about how you can do that too with completely unrealistic uh entry points and you know things that you will never have access to that allowed them to get where they are that i'm not such a fan of that's kind of a drag to see so many people selling a dream that just doesn't exist um but yeah, at the same time, you you don't hear musicians saying, well, this year I made like 
$72,000 from touring or something, or I made... You know, my Spotify streaming was like $14,723.82. Like, you don't you ever see people breaking that down. Um, I've actually broken down my streaming before. I shared that in my Telegram channel. Maybe that'd be a great YouTube video to make. A little movie about that, about the streaming thing. I don't want to harp on about Spotify being so shit um, that much, but I never really did anything in high definition with high production value uh on youtube so maybe that'd be a good one and i really did i showed screenshots of everything of every single penny uh, i had made for every album i recorded in my whole recording career as an artist and broke it all down and said how much i'd spent on the albums and you know you know how i was like negative seventy five thousand dollars or something on album productions for my career um so yeah maybe that would be a good one to do i gotta think about that get a script together for it um but yeah i don't you know and, and even though i have been maybe more vocal than most uh, or at least most people i know or I, I see um i think yeah i think it's good to, to 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 try and do more of that and to try and encourage people not to feel ashamed you know whether you make bonkers like huge amounts of money or whether you're really struggling I think it's good to know both ends, you know, because then you can either, then you have something to to measure against. You're like, where am I at? Like, if I can be really honest about who I sort of match up to, what my goals are, where, you know, really where I am in the pantheon of this, this, this music business and this music industry, you know, having those sorts of figures out there can give you a realistic idea of maybe, well, maybe a little better idea of what's required, like what you might need to do next, where you might need to work harder. Um, and what might give you the most return and of course what brings you most joy what you the happiest doing and how you can mix all of those things up and sort of put together your own package to be successful and also like what do you want out of life do you want like 10 Richard Mille watches and, and a Bugatti and a BMW for the weekend but a Ferrari uh, for the month of February and all those kind of crazy shit or do you like well I'd like a watch that tells the time and a car that's got four wheels and might like to take a vacation once a year and, and like take care of myself and have dental and vision and, and like a, a health care and stuff like that. Like, you know, wh where are your goals at? And um, I think it could be really, really helpful if more people were a bit more open in that department. Um, and I'll try my best to do it. Like I said, I'm, I'm totally uh, going to do that. I think that's a good sort of like middle of the year thing to do, maybe June or something, June, July, once I've got like all the data from really dedicating six solid months of um, YouTube growth and showing everyone what that looks like. And of course, like showing people that at January 1st, I didn't start from zero and go to 100,000 subscribers if I even get there by April. I mean, I started at 68,200, uh, you know, because I've been around since 2006 on this fucking platform. So I've been around, what's, uh, whoa, how long is that? No, 17 years. Oh, that's frightening when you think about it like that. Yeah, so that's really poor growth. <laughs> 68,000 people took me 17 years. At that rate, um, my great grandchildren could see could be doing the channel and it still wouldn't reach a million followers so it's good subscribers sorry so yeah um i'll also be very transparent about like where i started and um sort of lifetime uh adsense and, and when my channel got monetized it was probably super different <laughs> back then 17 years ago I'd, i'm not sure I'd, I'd have to actually have to look i have no idea when it got monetized some people know exactly i think peter mckinnon has a has a has a story about like oh there's suddenly there's money in my account and there's something like 40 cents or so a dollar it's something really low but he was like oh shit there's money in there and i love doing this and i want to be better at this and i'll just i know i can work really hard at it and be successful and here he is he's got a multi-million dollar empire and really only a few years later so um it's going to be interesting to see how my data stacks up to those kind of people it'd be really nice to compare and contrast to huge channels and look at their growth and see what's going on here in the you know, in my little corner of the base world. Um, and I just really appreciate everyone who's listening, being along for the ride. 
Um, and if you haven't already, like, comment, and subscribe on the video. That really helps. The like button is really a powerful tool. And the fact that a conversation starts happening with under the video in the comments is apparently amazing for the um, for the algorithm and, and really helping YouTube to promote that to people who might be interested in seeing it. So if you can do that and uh, don't mind helping out, it's totally free um, and it is greatly appreciated. And of course, if you're not on the main channel, go over there as well. Um, as you will see from the last few weeks, I'm uh, really, really working hard on this and dedicating a serious amount of time even to the detriment of my playing a little bit so i have to really have to find a balance now with that um so yeah it's just it's from my side it's all really really a lot of love and uh appreciation i think um i can't say that enough uh, i will not stop saying that and um yeah, there were people like you know people concerned like, hey, don't don't worry about the negative comments. That, really, don't worry. I am not worried about the negative comments. They are a source of hilarity, um, a light comedic relief at this point. And thankfully, I don't. Thankfully, YouTube is the only place. Unless you come to my Substack and get in and hurl abuse at me, uh, which is also linked below. If you know, I get into a little more detail of what I'm trying to do. Every YouTube video I put out is also make a post sort of corresponding with that on the Substack, on my newsletter, on the blog, and sort of go into the detail if people, you know, they're a much smaller portion of the audience is into that, I know. Um, but if I can give a little more context and share a few more photos or audio samples, things that don't make sense for a compact and compelling film edit for YouTube, I can add them in the Substack, and that's all free as well. So it, it's just the mailing list, it's the newsletter. And whenever I post, it shows up in your uh, inbox. That's where the podcast goes out as well. So if you're listening and you're not uh, subscribed to the Substack, do that. It's also free. And um, and we should be less worried, less afraid about being successful, both emotionally and mentally and, and with joy and happiness for what we do, as well as financially speaking as well. And uh, I think it's healthy. We make a shitload of money to share it with other people. And if I get to that point in my life, I, I would like nothing more than to be able to, you know, give to charity and just do good things. You know, I even mentioned a little bit that uh, about that last time. I'd love to have some sort of some sort of way to help young musicians, you know, whether that's with pedals and being able to do deals with companies and get, you know, gear into the hands of kids who really need it, whether that's instruments. You know, I have a little bit of experience with that going down to Cuba with Chelsea and how crazy it is in Cuba and how much they need things. And I know they are not the only place in the world that is in need. And, and shit, I mean, I know in, in the city I live in, in Los Angeles, there are kids in need of stuff like that. And I'm a big believer that music is super important early on. It's, uh, it's saved my life a few times. So if I can do that for someone else, that is something that's definitely on the radar. So that's a, that, that should actually be a huge part of the YouTube sort of mission statement as well, I think, and finding ways to uh, to really do some good things. I think it's possible. I see a lot of people doing it in different worlds, like the Mr. Beast thing. I just see a lot of philanthropic uh, activity happening as a result of making films and uh, and making art and sharing it with the world. So that's where I'm at. Um, I'll keep reiterating it. I want to keep, keep uh, repeating the important information and that's really important so appreciate you cats listening um we'll check in with you next week on uh, next episode of podcast that's it later <laughs>